Good morning. I'd like to say a special welcome to those of you in the bleacher seats. Good morning. And those of you in the premium, premium seats, we're glad that you're here. Those of you that are joining us via our internet hookup, we're glad that you're worshiping with us as well. It's great to come into the house of the Lord and worship the Lord. And if you haven't worshiped so far, you're probably not going to. The music just lifted us closer to the Lord. Scriptures we've read have drawn us into his presence. And by the way, if this is your first time here, we're doing a series on the family. Now, if you're single, the family probably doesn't. Oh, another sermon on the family. Stay with me. If you're about to get married, you're wondering, what am I walking into? Stay with me. If your family has shrunk because it's just you after having a family, stay with me. Just in two or three sentences, we're on part three. Part one was in our Families of Faith series was God's family is a prodigal family. We often refer to the prodigal son, but God's family, we as part of God's family have been a prodigal family. And thank goodness he sent his only begotten son that we might be restored to our heavenly father. The second piece, uh, the second in the series was God's family of faith on earth was created to reflect the heavenly family, his heavenly family. And what goes into our nuclear families, our families of origin and the families that we live in must be faith, must be trust. The world's in terrible shape. And I believe that families of faith are at the core of carrying the Christian message forward. Do you believe that, friends? So today, part three, I, I, can't, I just keep thinking, Lord, this series is really, really at the core of what we are about missionally as your people here on earth. The mission and purpose that you've placed us here. The family of the future, families of faith, that will face the future. And the future of the family is God's future here on earth. For we are just one generation away from lack of faith on earth. Do you believe that, friends? You can look around and see the wickedness in society. You can see the struggles and temptations that lie inside and outside families of faith. What does the future look like? What does the future hold? What is the future dependent on? What is most important about the future? The pundits will declare, it's that time of year, uh, that different parties are talking about the future and they'll use sound bites to describe how wonderful the future will be. I believe at the core, at the core of the future of society, at the core in the future of the world is the foundation of the family. Now, what does that future look like? I'd like to suggest to you today that the future looks like the present and the present and the future are tied up in the seed. Let me put it a different way. If you were a farmer, what's most important? The crop you have in the field or the seed for the next crop? Hmm. What's most important? Those who have been Christians for 10, 20, 30 years, four decades, five decades, or those who are in their formative years? Hmm. Is the future of the church somewhere out there? Or is the future of the church present in the church right now? And is the present of the church? 
Hmm. Why is the pastor asking so many questions this morning? Well, I can tell that you're staying with me so far. So as we look at the future of the church, we indeed do have a future. But we must realize the future is present right here today. And I'd like to suggest to you today that in, inside of our church, we might have three people groupings. We have the foundation of the church. We have the future of the church. And we have the formative of the church. We have the foundation of the church. And there's no scientific basis to this. It is just my arbitrary arbitrary kind of dividing up the church in three groups. So you have the foundation of the church, that which is real stable. Those are the maybe 25, 26 plus years. You know, you change a lot in the earlier years. But after 25, 26, or 30, you don't change as rapidly. And by the time you hit 40, 50, 60, or 70, you change very slowly. Do you believe that? You actually become more change resistant, but you become the foundation of society and of the home and of faith that you, pro you provide a stability for. The future of the church, I'd like to suggest to you, is probably an age bracket of somewhere between preteen and 25. They are the group that is embracing that which is new. They are the learning group. They are the discovery group of saying, Lord, how is it that you're going to use me to change the world? I want to be committed to you. The formative group, the third group, the formative group is the preteen and under. They are the group that is learning about life and what life is all about. God's family are called by God to be faithful. And they're called by God to, uh, to include the formative part of the church as the present and future of the church. Did you catch that? Now, what age bracket is that? Preteen and what? Under. Now, how is it that they are the present and the future of the church at such an early age. We're going to start there with that age bracket. And those of you that are in the other brackets can listen in. Well, let me ask you, how many of you would consider yourself part of the foundational group? That's the uh, <clears throat> age brackets that I already mentioned. Foundation is probably 26 and up, if you'll admit to be beyond that. Okay, how many of you are in the formative years? That's a kind of teen to 25, 26. Raise your hand. How many, how many of you are in the form? I, I think I, I misspoke there. The future part from uh, teen to 26. Okay, how many of you are in formative? Age uh, three in consciousness to, um, to pre-teen. Three and up. And how many of you are 62 going on four? <laughs> we'll talk to you just momentarily. You're included here as well. What does love mean? As we think of family of faith, families of faith, as I started to uh, do research on this, in about 45 minutes, I had 80 pages printed out. And I said, this must go into the distiller. Condensed it down to about 40, and I said, this must go into the distiller. Condensed it, my notes are about six or eight pages. There are 1,200 verses in the scripture that re refer to children. Children are the future of our faith. So a group of professional people posed the question to a group of four to eight-year-olds. What does love mean? Children sometimes answer with such clarity and honesty. So just listen to a few responses as we begin. 
Love is when my grandmother got arthritis. She couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands have got arthritis too. That's love. Rebecca, age eight. Love is when someone loves you the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Billy, age four. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Terry, age four. Love is what happens in the room, in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. Bobby, age seven. Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. <laughs> Nicole, age seven. Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are friends even after they know each other so well. Tommy, age six. During my piano recital, I was on stage. I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that. I wasn't scared anymore. Cindy, age eight. What does love mean? Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Ellen, age five. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him home all alone all day. I know my sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and then has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> now this is love. Lauren, age four. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down, and little stars come out of you. What an imagination, Karen, age seven. What does love mean? You really shouldn't say, I love you, unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. Jessica, age eight. What does love mean? Just ask somebody in the formative years. For you see, it's not a logic, reasoning thing for them. It's something that happens in the heart of the individual. It's something that is experienced in life. It's something about the relationship between me and you. It's something about how you care for me and I express myself to you because love isn't just about something that goes on here it's about something that happens here and in the formative years we are so transparent with that if you want to know what's going on ask somebody who's four or five years old they'll tell you straight up What does love mean? Author and lecturer Leo Buscaglia said he was asked once to judge a contest. The purpose of the contest was to find the most caring child. The winner was a four-year-old, four-year-old child whose next door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon seeing the man crying, the little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed into his lap, and just sat there. When his mother asked what he said to the neighbor, the little boy said, Nothing. I just helped him cry. And sometimes... We think that those in the formative years 
really don't have anything to teach us. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For we're going to look at some passages that are addressed to, as the writer says, to dearly loved children. And I'd like to suggest to you that includes all of us at all different ages across the spectrum and particularly to those in the formative years. What does it mean to love? It means to walk in love. It means to obey God. It means to talk about God. To have the walk meet, match the talk. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, starts out, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly, what does your Bible say? As dearly beloved or dearly loved children. I like that. God says, follow me. You're the family of God of the future. In order to be the family of God for the future, we must be the family of God today. He must be living in a dynamic way in our hearts and lives, for we carry this message forward. So it trickles down into the foundation, so it trickles down into the church of the future, so it trickles down into the church in the formative years. Dearly beloved, my dear children. First off, verse 2 says, Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Walk in the way of love. You've been in family circles where it's just ever so apparent the way they talk to each other. And if they've only been married three weeks, a certain brightness in their eye, a lilt in their voice. Is there anything else I can get for you, dear, after supper? Can I help you with the dishes? I have no idea how it works or when it happens, but amnesia sets in. And somehow they forget some of that stuff. Or maybe it's after a disagreement and an argument and a sense of if I don't get my way, I'm just going to roll up and shut down and be cold until he or she fully understands how determined I am to let them know that I am right. And coldness and sterileness get, uh, takes the place of love and compassion in the home. I have no idea how it is in your home. But the scripture says, if we are going to be Christ's children of the present and the future, we must walk in the way of what? What does the Bible say? In the way of love. In John, our scripture reading today from John chapter 4 verses 8 says, whosoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Verse 12 says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete, where? In us. But we must learn to love one another. I don't know how it was with you and, and the home that you grew up in, commonly referred to your nuclear family. It is often, uh, let me ask you another question. How many of you have ever taken one class in family or family parenting? Just one. Raise your hand high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You got a jump start on the rest in the congregation. How many of you have taken more than ten classes? How many of you think families are vitally important? Well, that's, that's almost everyone here. So, follow along with me in Scripture. 
if we are going to have the strongest foundations, our homes and our families must be built on an atmosphere of love that pervades the family. How do you determine an atmosphere of love? You just ask a four-year-old, does mom and dad love each other? Kind words are found in a home. Encouraging words. Forgiveness. Softness. The tenderness of touch. Expressions of remorse when you've wronged somebody. A willingness to forgive even when they haven't asked for it. Just walking up and saying, you know, I must have misunderstood. I forgive you. And watch a smile on their face. And say like, "Uh, yeah, but I didn't ask for it. Love prevails. Love softens. Love shapes. People love to be in an atmosphere of love. And they don't like to be in an atmosphere of bitterness and hatred and controlling and game playing. And, and, and. Beloved, my beloved children, love one another and walk in the ways of love. Secondarily, in verse 3, among you there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality or of any impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. That means regardless of what age you are, whether you're five going on six, whether you're 16 going on 26, whether you're 26 going on 46, that which is evil, that which would draw us away from God, needs to be laid aside. Because we want to live pure lives for God. There's not a perfect person here today. Not in past tense, not in future tense, most probably. There's not a person here today that won't face temptations. But I will guarantee you, if you will make the determination, when the temptation comes, you just turn that over to Christ and say, Lord, I can't handle this temptation and love you at the same time. So would you please meet the tempter right where the tempter is coming? And watch that temptation fade. Do you believe it works that way? If we're going to walk in love, we must know the power of God's love in our life. To remove ourselves from the temptation and walk in the ways of God in love. The third piece would be found in verse 4. The future of the church is found in families of faith. Verse 4 says, nor should they be obscenity, foolish talking, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. It is in having our language and our behavior and living a life of thanksgiving to God. There is something about praising God and being thankful for the way that God has blessed us, the way that God leads us, that changes our demeanor, changes our character, and people are attracted to that. Have you ever been around people that are just effervesce of thanksgiving? Mildly annoying at some times, aren't they? Sometimes you just want to have a pity party. Can I tell you all my problems? It's okay. Find a good friend. Unload and get over it. But to be that chronic person might be indicative of something going on in your worship experience of God. Because we have so much to be thankful for. We are a people of faith. We are a people of hope. We are a people that has our foundation firmly rooted in God, and we are God's children. If you have nothing else to be thankful for, that ought to be blazoned right on your heart mantle today. I am a child of God. There is so much darkness in the world today. People looking for a reason of hope. Looking and chasing after this and that. And as we worship, we find our reason for thanksgiving. We need to talk of our faith. Verse 6, 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such thing, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Let no one deceive you with what? Empty words. Empty words are something like this. Just think positive things and everything will turn out all right. Just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Be a man. Be a woman. Get what you want. Determine your course in life and go after it. And everything will turn out all right. How's that working for you? Hmm. There's a lot of power in positive thinking, don't get me wrong. But the real power comes from Christ. The real power that will see you through from the acknowledgement and the determination to the completion in living a life in Christ comes from Christ. It doesn't come from, from self-hypnosis and determining, I'm just not going to do that anymore. Because I will tell you, friends, my personal experience as I've tried it, it doesn't work. And I've got more gray hair than you. So I've tried it longer than you. But it just doesn't work. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Talk of faith. Live that faith. Look at Christ for your walk. And change the course of your conversation from I want this to Christ wants this for me. I am a child of God and my Father wants this for me. I am a child of God and I want to honor my Father. It changes the focus. It changes the direction. It causes us to look up where power and life's guidance comes from. Verse 8, two more, um, two more thoughts of the future of the church in the formative years and in the future of the church. For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light, uh, you are in light in the Lord. Live as children of what? Of light. For the fruit of your light consists in goodness, righteousness, truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Verse 8 says, "You, For you were once, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Once in darkness, now in light. Once in the camp of darkness of the world, now in light. It's an amazing thing that people that have walked in darkness, walk in light, go back to the darkness to find more light. Hmm, how does that work? It's an amazing thing that people in darkness search in darkness for light. Hmm, how does that work? It's an amazing thing that people in darkness wonder why there isn't light in darkness. Hmm, how does that work? Families of light. Families following the Father of all light. Families who are children of the light, bringing light to a dark world. Families of faith and the future of faith, the foundation of our communities, is found in the families living in the light. I am so optimistic with the church for the church future today, friends, are you? I'm optimistic because God is still on the throne. But I'm also cautious to say that just as surely as I can tell you that you are children of light, there is one who would love to have you be a child of darkness. Looking on your computer at things you shouldn't be looking at. Saying things about people that should never come forth from the mouth of a Christian. Thinking and acting out thoughts that are outside outside of what God wants for your life. Walking as children in the light. The fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. For John says, Whosoever does not love 
does not know God because God is love. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. John says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions in truth. 1 John 3.18 We love him, the scripture says, because he first loved us. So, just three little words really sum up the future of the church. Ephesians 5.1 at the end. My dear children. We think of children at this age. We think of children at this age. And we think of children at this age. And the future of the church is dependent on all of them. So what is the best witness to the world? You, you, you probably have read this already. But I would challenge you with this challenge as we close our time together. It is our own character and experience that determine our influence upon others in order to convince others of the power of Christ's grace. We must know its power in our own hearts and lives. The gospel we present for the saving of souls must be the gospel by which our own souls are saved. Only through a living faith in Christ as a personal Savior is it possible to make our influence felt in a skeptical world if we would draw sinners out of the swift running current our own feet must be firmly planted upon the rock, Jesus Christ. Ministry of Healing says the badge of Christianity is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but it is that which reveals the union of man with God by the power of his grace manifested in the transformation of character. The world is to be convinced that God has sent his Son as Redeemer. No other, no other influence can surround the human soul has such a power as the influence of an unselfish life. Now, if you forget everything else I said today, take these words, burn them in your heart, take them with you this week. Because it says the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. The strongest argument of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. So my dear children, Today, we take this full circle. We are to be a family of faith in our nuclear family, in our church family. We are to take that faith missionally into a gospel world. But as God the Father looks down, he wants to see in our lives his character being fully displayed in talk, in actions, in words, in deed, because the strongest argument for Christianity is a loving, in lovable Christian. Because when they've seen the child, who have they seen? When you see the child, the four-year-old, and they look like a 
split, a spitting image of mom or dad, and mom or dad are not there, but you know it's so-and-so's child. When you hear that voice on the phone of the 18-year-old who has just gone into this voice mode and you think you're talking to dad, who, do, who are you reminded of? So too, when the world looks at the children of God, whether they're three, nine, fifteen, twenty-five, forty-five, ninety-five, my dear children, God wants the world to see him when others see you and me. The future of the church is the present of the church in each one of his children's lives. This morning, we're going to close, uh, we're going to close this part of our worship service together. It's an amazing thing to be part of the church family. And one of the amazing groups in our church family that we often take for granted is that age bracket between teen to uh, preteen to early young adult, commonly called the youth group. I know some of you being 45 still sit in on the youth group at occasion. They let you in. But they've been working on some exciting things as they've had Sabbath school class together. And they like to share with you a presentation this morning that reflects an activity that they've done in their class and presented as a gift. So please come and share. Test, test. So collectively, uh, the youth leaders decided one time that uh, the entire youth really enjoys embracing creativity. Uh, we are created in God's image, and there are many things, many non-physical features that we bear as humans um, that we've inherited from creation, including creativity itself. God created the heavens and the earth, and man, and animals, and trees. In the same way, we can also be creative in the arts and in ideas. So <clears throat> the youth leaders, we all got together and we decided we would create an activity where it would be a collaborative effort on behalf of the youth to paint a painting. And uh, we chose to paint a painting of Jesus, the face of Christ. Um, one verse that really echoed to us, uh, very similar to what Pastor Rick just mentioned, is that um, Jesus was talking to his disciples and Philip says, well, how, how do we know what God looks like? And so then Jesus says, oh, well, if you've seen me, then anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So this verse, combined with uh, this idea, this collaborative effort on this painting that we worked on, I think since September, uh, it, it didn't take that long, but we would just bring the painting in, work on it a little bit, and then bring it back another Sabbath and, and, and work some more progress on it. So the painting's here. It's ready to be unveiled to everybody. Big surprise. So without further ado, let's unveil the painting. Now a little, a little bit about the painting itself. It's comprised of four quadrants. So these are individual panels up here. And uh, first, what we did is we had a reference, and then we grid, we put a grid on the reference, and we put a grid all over the canvases, uh, and then the first step was to draw in all the lines, of course, uh, on each of the canvases. And once the lines were drawn in, then uh, we took the time to paint it, uh, and then we lettered it with the, the verse up here. So if you, maybe after the service you want to come up here and take a look at it, you can. Um, and this is the painting. So we plan to hang this up in the fireside room, because that's our youth room. And it needs a little bit of decoration in there. <laughs> um, uh, please enjoy. It's, a, it's our gift, the youth's gift to the church. <laughs> <laughs> 